Good morning. Welcome to the mission of Maitreya's Satsang Room, uh, Cyber Church. I hope you are here to learn about the mission and uh, what we are having here to offer you. As you might know, this is the revelation of the seven seals, invitation of all religions. This mission has been prophesied coming to humanity. It is always in all religions have been talked about that one day the kingdom of God will come on earth. Now, of course, this religion think they will bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. Jews say they are the elected ones, they are the ones who bring the kingdom on earth. Christians say they are the only way. Muslims say they have the last word. And Baha'i said we are the last manifestation. Of course, when we go to the God's word and revelation, we see that he has a different plan and he will culminate his revelation after the revelation of the seven seals or the seventh angel comes. And in his, uh, this, uh, this uh, a scripture, he clearly says that no one knows the truth until the seventh angel comes and he will reveal the truth to humanity and God is no longer a mystery. So far, to this point, God is a mystery. Therefore, anyone who says they have the truth, they have the answer, they have the revelation, they have the religion, it is not the whole picture of the truth, but is a part of the truth and is not complete. And God says, it will only be completed when the seventh angel comes, when the seven seals is open. And uh, this mission has opened the seven seals and fulfilled the prophecies that God has said will be fulfilled by the seventh angel and also many other things that are based on the word of God and is fulfilled in this mission and through this vessel. And then, how could this revelation and this vessel be anything but from God when it fulfills the things God has said will be fulfilled through this revelation? And therefore, those who say otherwise and try to bring negativity to the mission, they are doing it to themselves, and unfortunately, they will suffer for creating negativity towards something is, which is godly. And uh, I pray that God be merciful to them, and I say, God, forgive them. They know not what they do, because they think they are correct when the scripture says that no truth, no revelation, no religion, no teaching will be perfect until the seventh angel comes and it's then that the mystery of God will be finished and if they had even the slightest spirit of truth in them and wanted to um, know the truth with realizing that the prophecies are fulfilled, the book with the seven seals is opened, the seventh revelation of God is unified, and the seventh seal is revealed to humanity, and they will have no choice but say, yes, these are the word of God, therefore we accept this as God's revelation, and if they do not, this is the time of sundering, because this is time of the end. And God said at the end there will be a sundering between the chaff and the wheat. And I hope they realize this and become wheat and the stuff become chaff and will take this revelation seriously. If they will take this revelation at least something to look into, go to our website, read what is being revealed to them, study them, ask questions and be 
very diligent in finding out what it says and is, that they may forget about their dogmas, their own understandings, what the preacher tells them, or what the tradition has brought into them, but say, I am the seeker of the truth, and I want to know what is this Maitreya talking about. Is he really the Antichrist, as many people come and tell you he is, or he is really fulfilled the prophecies that the Word of God said he will. If he is fulfilling what God said he will fulfill, how can he be Antichrist and not the truth? So, I am very concerned for these people, and I, I hope they will realize that you know, they are doing it their, to their own, you know, thrill, and hopefully they will realize this, and come, and at least, as I said, to consider, to go, to search, to knock, to ask questions, and the door will be open to them, if they just rely on their own understanding, their own narrow, narrow realization, I'm afraid, they are going against the will of God and they will be hurting them, themselves in the long run. And also, those who bring the negativity and are opposing to us and create, try to say we are not good, what, what, what is wrong here? Why they don't just realize that if they have the truth, Okay, if I have the truth, I'm not, I'm not worried about anything in the universe. If I am saved, then I'm saved. That's it. You know, I have to, don't worry. If the even devil comes to me, I am saved. Now, I'm not afraid of Antichrist or anything. I will go my way and say, I leave you Antichrist to God, and I will go to God. Now, is it supposed to be that they are really, are not sure that they are saved? And their God is not really, you know, the God of the Bible and the Revelation and the, and the Abraham and Isaac and uh, Jacob. It's, 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 they have to ask themselves, why are we opposing everyone on the earth? You know, if we are secure in our revelation and our teaching in our God, therefore, who cares, you know, who is what and what is who? But... The most important is that we have the truth and we are saved and God is with us. That's exactly what the mission and the people in it feel. God is with them. God is with us. We are not afraid of anybody. We don't go and open a room, you know, and tell them they are the devil or they are the cult and they are this and that. And who is a cult anyway? Cult is an organization that they profit or the personality become more important than the message. Hey, what religions or organizations do that? That their profit is becoming more important than their message of the profit? Hmm, let's think about it. You know, who is the most important? The person who brings the message or the messenger? If I am the, pro you know, and I have a message from a country to go to another country and I go to the head of the state there and say worship me, I'm not going to give you the message am I a good messenger? They, they, I can give the message to them, I'm asking them, I actually I'm depriving them from the message which comes from God so think about your religion think about your tradition, think about what your preacher have taught you and realize that in order to go to God, you do not need a median. You have to go to God directly. God is closer to you than yourself. And therefore, this mission which does not bring and teach that the messenger is greater than the message is not a call. It cannot be actually, I don't care. You want to walk out of this mission tomorrow? Bye-bye. You know, it's not something I'm going to brainwash you and keep you in the mission. Not a bit. I'm not interested if you are not interested. If you are not interested in God, 
I'm not interested in you. <laughs> it's very simple. And when you are here, you are here by your own will, and you can walk away anytime you want. And uh, it is not something that we will push on you. So, so, the, so it is. Let they tell these people that you should meditate on this thing. You at least should know about us first before you jump to the conclusion. And uh, as the Christ said, take the bean out of your eyes first before you can judge your brother or even Maitreya. Okay. So, as I said, I pray for them and tell God that God, they know not what they do because all the things in this mission is godly. Everything we say is based on the scriptures. Everything we do is pure. At least we try to make it as pure as possible. So let them know that please study us, test the spirit, and then judge. Even then, don't judge. Because you still have a bean on your eye and let God, who is pure, judge between us. Go your way and we go our way and let God say, decide who is the correct one. And even if, if you don't, then I'm afraid you're creating a very bad karma and you sure will fall into great ignorance, which is really the fire of hell. And uh, we go ahead. I, I guess there's a couple of people here new. Uh, go ahead and, and explain our teaching to them. Uh, our teaching is based on the a sign, we call it the greatest sign. If you go to our website, go to the website, and when you enter there, you will might see a pop-up window that just say OK, just um, something that is related to the Java uh, applet there. So just go ahead and, and, and click OK, and you will see the greatest sign there. And it's animated, you see a dot, and then formation of the greatest sign to I Ching, and then uh, Lotostica, and then on and on. The basic teaching is very um, simple, it's based on a path, which has five steps on it. The first step is the awakening of the spiritual forces, this is the I Ching in the very bottom. Of course, the very sign in the middle, if you are looking at it, that is a representation of God, which expanded and uh, spin out into the universe. And when that happened, that the balance in the, in the universe was disturbed and there was chaos. And that is what exactly when the, where the Bible starts, and that there was darkness and the deep and the Spirit of God moved up on the face of the deep and brought the, uh, those consciousnesses which were in darkness under control and on and on. When uh, that chaos was there, the Spirit of God moved into the darkness and went through a path, which we call an eternal divine path. And that path was the one that the Spirit of God went through and eventually reach back to Godhood, and that is what God saw, the light, and the light was good, and God blessed it, and on and on. And uh, you can see that light is different than the God, the lights that God created later as the sun and the moon. That was the light of the Christ that reached to Godhood. Therefore, that path became the eternal divine path, and in last 12,000 years, God has been sending each part of the eternal divine path as a separate religion. The first was revealed by Noah. Of course, it is much more detailed. I'm, I'm going through very fast here. Uh, you can read our uh, scripture, which is called the holiest of the holies, T-H-O-T-H, the last testament. It will explain it to you very in, in a much detail. You can download the whole uh, revelation from the website free of any charge. You can just read it, understand it, 
And of course, then you have any question, you are welcome to come here and ask them and all that. <clears throat> in, so, therefore, the first step was the awakening of the spiritual process, which covers with all the mystical path. The first mystical path came to humanity was through Nova, and that is when human the third eye was closed, and uh, Nova taught them how to meditate, and eventually those teachings came as the many mystical teachings in, in, in the world. The base of the mystical teaching is, know thyself to know God, or as the Bible says, be still and know that I am God, and all those mystical teachings says the same thing. If you become a still, you will know that God is already within you. You know, you don't have to go anywhere, you don't have to go to the church or mosque or, or uh, synagogue or, or, or temple. Your body is the temple of God. Your body mm -hmm. contains the self which is the same as God, which is, you know, with the big self, with S. Therefore, uh, mystical path includes Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Kabbalah, the mystical part of Judaism, um, saints in uh, uh, Christianity, Sufis in Islam, and many other uh, disciplines that include knowing yourself, meditating, chanting, dancing, you know, and all those things that it helps in the process. The next step is, some, in a mystical path, they say, that's it. You meditate and you awaken a special force, you reach your consciousness, like a drop of water, you fall into the ocean, and that's it. You become one with God. That is the goal of, uh, of, of the spiritual progress. But you can see that God brings another revelation to humanity, the Old Testament. In Old Testament, God is trying to find a people, the twelve tribes of Israel, that who accept God as uh, the king and his laws as, as the law of their community and therefore the next step is the creation of the communities of light. Communities of light is the community based on the eternal divine path and the God's, God's law. Therefore the first step in the path is awakening of the spiritual forces, know thyself, the second step is to direct this energy to create the communist of light. And communist of light are the community based on God and His Spirit. The, the triangle downward, which the, 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 the Old Testament, is based on the sign called the uh, sign of Solomon, or the, uh, the star of David. The, the triangle downward is the Spirit of God coming to man. And the triangle upward is the hierarchy on earth. Uh, triangle upward always shows the hierarchy. The top is the president and on and on. Here, of course, is the hierarchy of the uh, gods, uh, of the elects and God's people. And, uh, and of course, triangle downward is the uh, spirit of God. Therefore, a correct uh, godly organization is the organization which is triangle upward with the spirit of God in it. If you take the Spirit of God out, that organization is no longer godly as it represents God. Therefore, we can see that the next step in the, in the eternal divine path is to, to direct your energy toward the creation of the communities of light, where the opportunity will be given to everyone to progress physically, mentally, and spiritually. These are the three parts of the human that they have to progress in a very balanced way. If you progress only physically, your mind and your spirit is not going to be strong. If you uh, progress only mentally, you become mentally strong, but physically your body cannot carry your mental ability. If you become a, a spiritually strong, you might become a uh, escapist and you know, forsake the world and will not put effort into the world. So we can see that this three uh, levels of human being, physical, mental, and the spirit has to, you know, progress together. In the compass of light, that opportunity will be given to everyone. Uh, therefore, we can see the, the, the second level in the eternal divine path, creation of the compass of light, is the Judaism, is the Old Testament, 
And in order to create this Hasidic community, of course, sacrifice is necessary. You cannot create a community of light where everybody says, what is it for me, what is it for me? Only that sacrifice has been set or shown to humanity by Christ. Christ came and sacrificed himself all the way to cross. And therefore, he set an example for humanity that sacrifice or not being self-centered is necessary. Of course, he had two other uh, mission also. He gathered the people as was uh, prophesied he will, and he also re uh, released the grace to back to humanity after it was taken away at the time of the Garden of Eden. Therefore, those who have been following Christ or Christian, they really true, they have been saved by you know, grace. So, but that grace, of course, is now released to every human humanity. Those who believe that they can win God's grace, they will receive it freely because the grace has been released to every person. It does not belong only to Christians. Those who believe in the mission and the eternal divine death and this revelation, they will receive the grace. Therefore, the, one of the um, mission of the Christ was to show that in order to carry the communities of light, sacrifice is necessary. Without sacrifice, there is no communities of light. Now you sacrifice and, you know, a community you want to create, it doesn't happen. You become very discouraged and unhappy and, and, and then become depressed. You say, why I do all these things that's not happening? Or you do it and it happens and comes of light pops up all over the world and you become a lady and say, look, I'm great, I'm doing all this by myself and you become egoistical. Of course, the moment you become egoistical, what happens? That is exactly what cuts the grace from between you and God. Ego is the umbrella that we all have in, our, in the top of our head and be cutting the grace. The moment you get ego, grace is gone, no matter who you are follow or what you believe. If you have ego, that's it. You are, connect, you are disconnected from the grace. Therefore, in order to be able neither become depressed nor become elated and egoistical, the next step in the eternal divine path is surrendering the result to God. That means I do my best, I try to uh, uh, follow eternal divine path, I do be be my best, I sacrifice, I try to create the comes of life, but I surrender the result to God. And I say, okay, I did the work, but the result is God. You know, I'm not going to be attached to the result. Of course, greater than surrendering, the submission, you say God is, you always concentrate that God is true doing this through you, you are not the doer. If you are not the doer, therefore you cannot be attached to the result of your action. If I'm not giving you sad song, if I am just letting God come through and my word comes to you, if it's going to affect you, if you see the truth in it or not, it's, God, it's up to God. It's not up to me. I'm not doing anything. I'm just here sitting and letting God come and give this truth to you because He chose this vessel to do it. He has to, He is a spirit. He cannot just come to, to say, I'm here. Even if said, you can see Him. Therefore, He needs a body to come to humanity and that's what exactly who is the giving the sad song. It is Him coming through and therefore if you become submissive to God and let God come through you all the time, therefore you will not be attached to the result, you will be free from attachments and egotism and depression and all that. Of course, the fourth step, of course the third step was Christianity. The fourth step of surrendering and submission is the very essence of uh, Islam. Islam comes from the word Haslim, means to be surrendered and submissive to God. And therefore, with doing certain being surrendered and submissive to God, we are not going to be attached to the result of our action, and we are free to do will God's will without attachments, and therefore we will not become uh, depressed and all the result of the body. Until this point, we might become narrow in our approach. We might just like to direct our attention only to 
my community, to my city, to my state, to my country, to, to earth. The next step in the uh, eternal divine path is to become universalist. It means God is my father and mother, the universe is my home, and the rest of humanity and uh, creatures and being in the universe are the struggling being with me and they are my brothers and sisters. Therefore, with the universalism, you shatter all the narrowness of the mind. You look at every human as a spirit and an essence of God in them. And therefore, it, you do not see color, you do not see gender, you do not see any separation between them. And all these will uh, free you from any narrowness of the mind. Therefore, uh, the universalism is the a message of the Baha'i and Bab and Baha'i Baha'u'llah. They brought the teaching that you know the religions are basically the same and we are all the children of God and we have to realize that there is only one God, one humanity and we have to come together as his children. Therefore we can see that the uh, eternal divine, that is the five step of eternal divine path. Having a school process uh, directing your energy toward the creation of the uh, coming of life, sacrifice, surrendering and submission to God's will, and becoming universalist. If you go through that five steps truly, you will become an elect, which is the sixth seal. And that is where all the scriptures are talking about my elect will inherit the earth, will bring my kingdom to earth. And that is what we are looking for here, okay? That is why we are here to call the elect. As I say, this is the time of sundering. Okay? The elect are going to come gather to the mission, and those also who want to be elect, but maybe they are not elect, and those who are not elect will be sundered. They are the shaft. Okay? And uh, they also, of course, will live to God. God can do whatever with them. Now, we don't know what is planned. Of course, he says he's going to... Uh, gather them together and throw them to the lake of fire, okay? Now, what is the lake of fire? That is a very interesting question, you know, can I ask, what is the lake of fire? Lake of fire, of course, is ignorance. Ignorance is whatever, you know, you think is your understanding of God's plan and it doesn't include the eternal divine path, that is from ignorance. It means that is before the seventh angel. And whatever is between the seventh angel is what? is not perfect. Therefore, ignorance means having a little truth and thinking you have the whole truth. That is the most dangerous thing, to, to know a little truth and don't know the whole truth. And, uh, of course, elects are the people who will bring the kingdom of heaven on earth, accelerate, create the comings of light, will implement the uh, eternal divine path, and will accelerate human uh, progress to a greatest degree possible and will bring the golden age that many, many people know it is coming, and uh, well, the Judo, Christian, Islamic, Baha'i, they call it uh, Kingdom of Heaven on Earth, Buddhists and Hindus call it the golden age. So, uh, we can see all these things uh, are fulfilled, and everything shows that this is the time. As Christ said, when you see the, the weather is fair and and the sky is red, you know it's going to be some rain, and that's exactly what's happening right now. Every sign says, yes, this is true, and what we have here is from God, and we hope that you see this clearly, as many have already seen, and blessed are the, those whose hearts are pure and innocent, and they can see it like the children that Christ said, I, I pray to the Father that children can see this so clearly and those who have with big intellect and also, you know, with big understanding of themselves cannot see it and that amazes me very much. So this is our teaching. This is the revelation of the seven seeds, unification of religions. And all are welcome to go to our website, read it, understand it, ask questions. If you saw the truth, then you are a part of us. If you didn't see the truth, we leave you to God. So, now we go to the question. Go ahead, Dyer Wolf, but please stay on the topic. And uh, do not preach here. Stay on the topic about the mission. 
and we appreciate that. Go ahead. Uh, yes, actually, I have a question for you this morning, and uh, and then I have a follow-up question. Um, and I'm not here to preach nothing at all. I was wondering, I was wondering um, uh, uh, what has been revealed to you about uh, the classical Orthodox view of the Trinity, and if explain the Trinity to me if there is one, uh, and then uh, being in its completeness, if that would be all right, and then I have a follow-up question. Sure, uh, Dr. Wolf, and um, it has uh, been explained many times in the mission about the Trinity and why there are really u unity, there's no separation between them. Uh, God is both male and female, so therefore but at the same time, he is beyond. Therefore, the male part of, of God we call consciousness. It's the logic of the universe. Um, that the logic of, of the universe is the consciousness, and that is called Father. And the creative force in the, in the universe called uh, the creative force or trigunas in our teaching, which is the mother, which also is the Holy Ghost, which brings the revelation to the prophets and also is present in the universe and create everything and all things. Actually, that is also the word, the, create, the creative force behind all things, that all things are being created by it. Therefore, you can see there is Father and the creative force, which is the Holy Ghost, and there are one. You cannot separate them. It is like a two sides of the same of a paper. Cannot cut a paper and say, okay, I can separate one side from the other. It is absolutely impossible to separate them. Father and Mother are one. Father and the Holy Ghost, God and the Holy Ghost are one. Now, God, the Father and the Holy Ghost, or the Father and Mother, are a spirit. It is a spirit. I shouldn't say are, because really it, because it's one, <laughs> there is no separation. It is a spirit, and therefore it cannot manifest itself to humanity. Therefore, he needs a body, he needs a person, he needs an individual that can manifest that spirit to itself, to himself. And that individual, usually, God will prophesy for a long, long time before he comes. That prophecy has been given to the of coming of Christ. That prophecy was given of coming of Prophet Muhammad. The prophecy was given of coming of Bab and Baha'u'llah. And the prophecy is also given of coming this revelation. When that person, eventually, God decides to send to humanity, comes... That person manifests that Spirit of God through himself to humanity, and he becomes the Son. That is what the Son, son means. Son bring the perfection. Also, as God said in, the, in Revelation chapter 23, those who will overcome will become my Son. Does that mean, if you believe that the Son means that God came to Mary and made the Son, how about these other sons that he says if they overcome, will be my son. Is he going to be with going with other women and make more sons? Or he is really meant, whoever overcometh, become my son. What does that mean? It means those whose spirit and my spirit become one. And as Christ said, you should become perfect as the Father in heaven. If you become perfect as the Father, you become the Son of God. Okay? Therefore, and also, uh, Therefore, Christ was a channel, it, it, not a channel in the sense that a new angel, you know, talk about it, a um, revealer, a receiver of the revelation from the Holy Ghost and God, and brought this to humanity, and therefore he was the Son of God. And he and all the prophets who have that ability to do that are the sons of God. And they, at the time that they come and they give the revelation, 
they bring the perfect revelation to humanity and only those who have fulfilled the prophecies of God and the scriptures have this ability to bring the purest form of the revelation from God not anyone else that is why a scripture and the word of God which come to us are so important and how do we know if that the scripture is true and the teacher is correct one has he fulfilled the prophecy has he been told to come if he has and what he says is based on the scripture therefore it is from God and we have to accept him as the prophet of God and the self -hope. so therefore we can see that so the, 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 the father is the consciousness, the Holy Ghost is the creative force, and they come through the Son. But the Father and the Son, when, 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 when the Son is revealing this revelation, and is one with the Father and the creative force of the Holy Ghost, they are one. There is no separation. Father and Son and the Holy Ghost are one. So, also there are three apparent separate thing in the universe, but the reality, there is no separation. As I said, you, yourself, and God are one. You are already one with God. You know, there is no separation. That, that is the delusion that a lot of people have of a, no, God is up there somewhere sitting in a, in a throne, and I'm down here, and we are separated. That's not true at all. God is closer to you than yourself. You are the same thing and one. So, the Son, when He brings the revelation to humanity, and the Father and the Holy Ghost are one, therefore there is no separation. There is no trinity in the sense of separate thing. They are one. That's why, also it's true, you can say there is only one God. There is no trinity. Okay, because there is no separation between three, these three. They are all one. I hope this makes sense to you. Go, go ahead with your follow-up. Now, now, considering that you that you did say, if I am correct, that there is no Trinity, would you consider then um, the Trinitarian uh, belief or teaching or tradition to be heretical <laughs> and against oh, yeah, God and so against God? Uh, in other words, in other words, since it is not a truth or not a reality, as you have expressed, it is not. Um, uh, would that be something that, say, uh, uh, teaching or believing in uh, would be damnable for? Okay, Dari, what I did not say it is not, there, there is not three or they are not true, okay? As any, everything in the mission, we explain everything that will make sense to both sides, okay? Those who say there is only one God, they are correct, because consciousness and the creative force, or the or the uh, Holy Ghost and the Son are one. There is no separation, but there are three three part of the of God, or or the Messiah, or or the Son of God. He has to manifest the Spirit of God, which is consciousness and the Holy Ghost. But consciousness and Holy Ghost is nothing you can separate from each other. It is absolutely necessary for them to be together, and they are. Therefore, although there is consciousness and creative force, but there is nothing such a thing to say, you can take it and say, here is consciousness, and here is the you know, creative force. They are separated. They can't be. And then they manifest themselves through the Son, they become Father, Son and the Holy Ghost, which they are correct, they can say that, but in reality there is no separation, therefore those they, they believe in Trinity, you know, they have to realize that the Trinity there is no separation, it is only one, and those who believe only there is only one God, they have to realize God that God has the consciousness and creative forces and it comes through the Son. Therefore, it can be looked as three, but that three is not something you can separate and say they are separate beings or things. Okay, so uh, if you understand that, you know, to ju ju try to understand what I'm saying. Don't, don't interpret the way you hear it or you want to hear it. Okay?
If you hear correctly, I did not say, you know, they are wrong, that Trinity people are not wrong, the Unity people are not wrong either. As many things in the mission, if you hear the uh, explanation, you will see that, wow, both were right. Just like, uh, you know, Muslim said, Prophet Muhammad is the last Prophet. He is the Khatam of the Prophet. Baha'i said, no, he was Khatam, the, the, the seal of the Prophet. He said, you are both right. Okay. He was the last Prophet in a, in a sense that he revealed the highest spiritual realization, surrendering and submission to the will of God, and he is the seal of Prophet, because if you look at the greatest sign, Islam is at the very top of the greatest sign. So, both are correct, and if they cannot hear it and say, no, you are saying, if they believe in seal of Prophet, they are not correct, you know, they didn't hear, they didn't listen carefully, okay? If they listen, they say, oh, yeah, well, it makes sense. So, what Matthew is saying here, what was revealed, you know, 1300 years ago to Prophet Muhammad as Khatam, which can be said Khatam or Khatim, the last Prophet or the Silla Prophet, and God meant both of them. So is the Trinity and Unity. God can be looked at as Father, Holy Ghost, and come through the Son, so the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, but at the same time there is no separation. Go ahead, Kak. Um, Judaism, the Messiah, will rebuild the temple. And you talked about sacrifice. What sort of sacrifice are you talking about uh, to be made for the, for the uh, mission? Actually, we do have a temple uh, that uh, it includes all the um, religions of the world and unify them in one building as a temple. Uh, and each door will have a door for each religion to enter. Uh, and when they enter at the very center, they are one. <laughs> there is no separation between them. Actually, we have people in the mission. They are uh, Christian, they are Jews, they are Hindus, they are Buddhists. Well, they are M Muslim or, 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 you know, even Baha'is. And, and, but they don't call it each other any, uh, any of those. They believe that they, they are not. Okay, they are, they are just a child of God or children of God and they are getting along just fine. This is the foretelling of coming of the peace on earth. So, uh, the temple, actually I hope one day we can build our temple in Jerusalem and, ev and eventually every religion can come to Jerusalem as an international city and each person enter their uh, religion from that side. Actually, we do have a veiling wall, we have a Christian area, we have Muslim area, and we have Buddh we have a Baha'is area in, in that city. So, if we can make a kind of a temple that it connects all of them, and then in the center they can come all and see, wow, God said, you know, He's going to send this revelation and unify them and really there is no separation between them and each of them realize what was the message God was sending to them they will realize they are brothers and sisters and we should get along and share whatever they have and, and, and wouldn't fight as they are doing that and if they continue fighting of course I'm afraid we will have a lot of suffering will come to humanity if you might ask they were teaching today that I thought they will but if they accept this today, we will have peace tomorrow, okay? But of course, there is a lot of, you know, uh, destructive energy on earth, and a lot of ego, and a lot of, you know, competition, and also, you know, a lot of belief that is based in the political maneuvering and all that, you know, that they cannot just accept our teaching and say, yes, it makes sense. But God said His will, kingdom will come, so His kingdom will, but... Unfortunately, it sounds like humanity has to go through a very rough time, you know, before that comes about. So, uh, so indeed, mission will build the temple eventually in Jerusalem, but not according to Jews, <laughs> not according to Christians or Hindus or Buddhists, according to God. Okay? So Jewish people realize, yeah, maybe they have some truth. Yes, then the Messiah comes. When the, when the revealer of the seven seed comes, 
when the last revelation comes, a temple will be built, but it will include everyone on earth. And if they don't accept it, of course, they're going to go ahead and fight with Muslim, and Muslim is going to fight with Christian, and Christian is going to fight with Hindus and Buddhists, and, and, and the mess we have in our hand will continue as it is. So, uh, the, the, the prophecy is fulfilled. There is a temple God has given to humanity to be built, and it is ready to go, and I'm hoping eventually we build it, many of them, all over the world, and humanity will come and join and see that they are one. What kind of sacrifice? Sacrifice, it depends upon your uh, ability, your mission, your dedication, your uh, uh, want, how long, how much do you want to sacrifice? <laughs> you can sacrifice by, uh, you know, just uh, coming to the mission room, you know, twice a day and do your uh, prayer with us. That's a sacrifice. You could be doing something else. You can, you can do something you know you, you like to do to drag yourself away from the world and say, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let the world get me. I want to go to, you know, to our God and come here and be with godly people. That is one sacrifice you can do. That is sacrifice. Uh, you can go all the way, dedicate yourself to the mission as some some people have, and become a teacher or or a supporter of the in a center or. Uh, con contact, the greater your sacrifice and your ability to, you know, see the mission and, and beauty of it and how much you want to do for God, the closer you will become to God. That, that's as simple as that. Okay? If you want to keep your will and, and your uh, life the way you want it, of course, you will have your will and your life, but you will not be closer to God. The more you sacrifice, the more you follow the eternal one path, the closer you will become to the Spirit. I hope that makes sense to you. Go ahead, God. Thanks. Thanks. Um, still, I have a lag here. Um, will, this have, will this all be fulfilled in your lifetime? Will the mission be realized, you know, while we're still alive? And um, also, the other one was um, a comment on what Thayer Wolf was saying about the Holy, or about the Trinity, and you talked about the Holy Spirit, but uh, Jesus said that the Comforter that was to come, um, he would send the Holy Spirit, but you said before that it was Muhammad, so um, I just you can clarify that, because before you had said in another song that it was Muhammad that was the one who was to come, and not the Holy Spirit, but now it sounds like you're saying the other opposite about the Holy Spirit. Okay, your first question, will the mission be uh, realized while I'm still alive? Um, we believe in reincarnation, and I have promised to my disciples and the organization that I shall return. So, so killing me or, <laughs> or doing anything is not going to work, not going to help. I'm going to come back and say, here I am, <laughs> with the seven seals and the revelation and the eternal divine path. And therefore, the arrangement has been made that when I leave my body, my disciples and those who are in the mission will be looking for me returning and continuing what we are doing. So, it is not a mission that it will end, you know, by me leaving my body. It is an op open-ended mission, and uh, we will continue this until the... Um, formation of the uh, hierarchy from the coming of light and the coming of the kingdom of heaven on earth, then I can leave my body peacefully and not return. Because then I don't have to be here. The coming of light is been created. The kingdom of heaven is on earth. Therefore, I don't have to come back. And then, of course, I will return each time that setup will not work and my present is going to be needed. So, um, it will be happening in my lifetime or not, doesn't make any difference to the mission, because we know that you know, uh, nobody dies, no, you cannot kill anyone, the spirit is forever, it's impossible to kill or destroy the spirit. He who, as the Bhagavad Gita says, who, who kills 
and who think and the person who think is killed both are in ignorance because you cannot kill the spirit it moves on and lives on therefore you know the, the end of the mission is not by me leaving my body therefore this mission continual mission not only me but my disciples also and those who are in mission when they leave their body they are going to return and uh, and therefore and each time they return few more people will add it to it and add it to it and add it to it so eventually we will reach a point that uh, uh, everybody will be in realize that god is one there is one religion one humanity under one god and therefore we have to bring this kingdom to earth uh, on earth so i hope that answers your question about uh, you know the organization and when it's going to be um uh, fulfill it will eventually fulfill will fulfill god said it will fulfill so it will uh, your next question was uh, uh, that you said it another time that the holy spirit that the comforter i did not say that the holy spirit is prophet muhammad that is what muslims say well, probably you have heard it in another room and you thought that's me who said that it has never been said here or in our teaching or in the ever anywhere in the whole world that he said the comforter is prophet muhammad that is the muslim understanding of the comforter our belief why prophet muhammad is a part of the only one path is based mostly on the promises that uh, god gave to abram and abraham abram was the father of uh, ishmael and uh, his wife uh, or the person who conceived the israel from him was uh, hagar and uh, therefore therefore he from all the promises he gave to abram was for ishmael and he gave the promise of the scepter which is the kingly um, the spiritual domination and he gave the birthright or the um, physical or worldly possession and he fulfilled both of them he gave a land which was you know without end not the beginning and the end um, and uh, he, the children of israel of course are arabs who eventually covered all the way from uh, saudi arabia to middle east part of the middle east to north africa to spain and from spain south america so you can see god gave them a big huge chunk of the real real estate in, in on earth and then god changed the name of abram to abraham and then he said not only your name is going to be abraham also your uh, wife's name is going to be sara instead of sarai sarai means princess sara means our princess so it is more than one then god gave the promises for isaac and later on to um jacob because jacob received both the birthright and the kingly scepter and god promised um isaac many many nations which later on they uh, they became the children of israel and the children of israel later on they were divided to two nation the southern nation of jews and the northern nation or the house of israel actually the first time in in the bible the first time you read the name jews or when they are in war with the house of israel in the northern kingdom which they were you know from the same tribes of course later on the house of the house of israel northern tribe are taken away and are scattered and according to our teaching they eventually end up in the north side close to caspian sea and eventually russia and europe and united and, and england and united states so you can see god gave also the children of uh, isaac a very big area to the united states and this mission came right in the border of north and north america and south america which are the children of israel and the children of ishmael so so because god gave the promise of the scepter or messiah or the prophet to both ishmael and isaac therefore both prophet the, the 
Christ and Prophet Muhammad have been promised to Ibrahim and Ibram to come. Therefore, it clearly shows that God meant to send these both prophets. If Jewish, Christian, and Muslim just understand this part, you know, we have united three, you know, half, a, half a humanity together. And it is right in your Bible. Go read it. He promises first to Abraham the same material position and scepter, and then he promises to Isaac the same thing. So that is the reason we believe that God promised Prophet Muhammad will come as the Prophet, and he did not because Christ said the Comforter will come. What that means is, you know, you can you can have the interpretation as the Muslim have it that he meant Prophet Muhammad because Comforter comes from the word Ahmad in Arabic, which Muhammad come from Ahmad, or you can say that if he meant when when the, in the um, later restaurant Holy Ghost came over the disciple and that's what he meant by the comforter so it is up to you can do it either way but none of them is not important the most important is what is the message of Christ and it was sacrifice I hope that makes sense go ahead Kag well you mentioned Aisha um, she was one of Muhammad's wives I, I believe she was only nine years old when he married her which today that's considered child molestation um, and, and also he had many wives um, how do you rectify the standing of the mission with the sanctity of marriage one man one woman and also that you know church and, and most um, you know religions um, with the polygamy and then, then also the uh, uh, if Muhammad is a prophet um, him having um, married a woman or a girl at age of nine. Uh, how do you rectify that? Well, if we, if we going out according to your understanding, then we have to forget about Abraham, uh, uh, Isaac, <laughs> Jacob. All of them married more than one wife, and they were plagamists, and we should just put them all to in prison <laughs> and tell them they were no good. And therefore, you know, it is a cultural thing that you believe that there should be one wife and one, one husband. You know, even in this culture, Mormons don't believe in that. At least they didn't for a while. And polygamy has been with us all through history. Even in, in this culture in the United States, many men have mistress and they pay for it. They get a apartment or something for the mistress while they have wives. And uh, also, uh, it was a matter of making a lot of more children. If there is one man and many wives, you can make many children. But if there is one woman and many husbands, uh, still you can not going to have as many children as the other way around. So it is a cultural understanding and uh, something that has been taught to you to believe in it that plagamy, plagamy is, you know, evil. But as I said, if that's evil, then Abraham was evil. <laughs> Isaac was evil, you know. And because all of them had more than wife. Even there's a story, even, you know, Christ had more than two wives, one wife, you know, Mary and, and Martha, you know, as, you know, mentioned many times in the Bible. So, we have to examine our uh, understandings with the reality of the world, and also realize that there is something that we have learned in our culture that we believe is correct. You know, of course, the best way for a man for a marriage it should be a man and a woman, and they should stay together and um, and faithful and base their life on God. And as our teaching, you know, emphasizes on it, but polygamy has been with humanity all along, and. Uh, it has never been considered by God as evil, but he, of course, says the best way is one man and one woman. Now, Prophet Muhammad, uh, Aisha, uh, was the, uh, a child of one of his close disciples, and they, he wished that they be married, and they also, also she was young when they betrothed together, the marriage did not consume, consummate it until later on, 
actually in those culture, uh, un unless the woman receives his first monthly period, is not, ac not accepted as a woman. And when that happens, she is she's considered as mature and able to marry. Therefore, I believe probably that also happened in that case, and they did not consummate their marriage until she was around 13 or 14 years old. So, uh, again, that is a misconception and a, something that I have seen a lot of Christians write in the many rooms. Hey, he was a child molester, pedophile, and all that. That is a big sin that you call the prophet of God a pedophile, and that is a big karma. Therefore, think, meditate, understand, realize, see God said both, Muhammad and uh, Christ will come as the prophet of God and do not just accept anything you hear but especially after you heard my explanation you should realize that that is a big sin to call the prophet of God a pedophile okay and also it is much based on your cultural understanding not on God's point of the view God never ever said polygamy is evil. Go ahead, Kai. Hello. It's about the law of God that came on Mount Sinai. Of course, Moses was never considered higher than the message, which was the law, um, the Ten Commandments. You know, you should not have no other, any other gods before me. Uh, the Lord thy God that shall make, not make unto thee graven image. And, you know, you um, should keep the whole uh, Sabbath day holy and uh, um, you know, not take the name of the Lord your God, they for he doesn't hold them guiltless and all those uh, they shall not commit adultery, they shall not commit um, murder, they shall okay, not commit you know uh, <laughs> shall not bear false witness, and shall not covet thy neighbor or his wife, thy neighbor's house or anything like thy neighbors. So how do you and your your just how do you keep the the commandments and teach your disciples to keep the commandments? For you know, these are everlasting covenants that the Lord God has made with with not only the house of Israel but the world, because the the law came from Mount Sinai for everyone, and all the law that we have is based upon the commandments. How do you keep these commandments? Actually, in in in, in reality, it was the fifteen commandments, the ten commandments, and uh, five of them was broken before reached to. <laughs> the children of Israel, and actually, and that is what we have: the fifteen commandments. It is given to humanity to follow. Humanity has the free will. Okay, that's a good thing and it's a bad thing. <laughs> it's a good thing because you have to choose to go to God. Okay, everything in the universe follow God's way. You know. A flower doesn't can say no. I'm not gonna um, grow, you know, as as God wants me to grow. I'm gonna grow a different way, or, or or a cat says, you know, I'm gonna go and marry a dog. You know, it can't. It just doesn't happen. But human have the ability to, you know, to choose their way, and actually that is what such a wonderful thing about human. If they decide to go to God, see God. That is why human is such a wonderful being. God gave them the free will. Now they choose to go to God. An animal that, that which has no free will, they have to obey God or the one who has the free will and say, no, I'm going to come to you. Of course, the one has free will and still he chooses to go to God and follow his word instead of following her or his, you know, desires. Okay? So... Uh, we can this is this free will is given to humanity and that is why the Ten Commandments or Fifteen Commandments is given to humanity. It says do this thing as, a, as Lord, your Lord's commandment. Now do you love your Lord as much that you say, Well I will listen to him or you say, Well maybe I don't listen completely, I don't listen fifty percent. Okay. Fifty percent makes you what? It makes you a lukewarm. Okay, and God said, you know, I don't like the world. Okay, He likes 100% dedicated people who completely dedicate, you know, their life and beings toward, just as Christ said, 
love your God with your all your heart, being mind, then you will go to Him. So, um, but but Christ didn't say, "I will make you to love your God with all your heart, mind, and spirit." Okay, it's up to you to decide to do that. It's the same thing for the fifth commandment or ten commandment. God has given it to you. Do you want to follow it or not? Actually, one person said. I realized the beauty of the Ten Commandments after I started following it. See, how makes life wonderful, easy, beautiful, and, and fantastic. Okay. So, so this law actually is not for God. It's not for me and you. If we follow it, we will reap the fruit and beauty of it. The, the, the eternal divine path is not for God. It's for me and you. If we follow it, we walk it, we will reap the beauty of it. So, the free will is given to you. And that's why I, I said, this is not a cult. I respect your free will. But your free will, by choosing the wrong path, have consequences. Okay. You can go to the, you know, in the, in the brink of the cliff, I say, well, I should just jump over the cliff. Okay, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to tell you, if you jump, you're going to get hurt, you might get, get killed, you might break all your um, bones. But eventually, if you decide to do it, nobody can, you know, prevent you from doing it. So, human has the free will, but God has the, um, gives you the result of your free will. If you choose not to go to God, you will fall into Maya, to the world, and you will be drawn into the world, and you will suffer because of it. But you should to do it. God already told you not to go that way. It's like a little child to tell him, if you touch the, the stove, you're going to get born. Okay. But the, he chooses to touch the stone. Will he get the born? He has the ability. We told you not to do that. But he chose to follow that, and he fell. Therefore, uh, the commandments, the eternal divine path, revelation, uh, all these this came to humanity. God also gave humanity the tree, free will to follow it or not. And your choosing will result what you reap. If you follow God 100%, you will not create any karma, you will not create any sin, you will follow the Ten Commandments, you will receive the grace, which makes it so easy to follow God's law. Most people have a problem to follow God's law because they are not in grace. In grace, actually grace is the law. There is no separation. If you have the grace, you follow the law. No problem. If you do not have the grace, the law is so difficult to do and follow. Okay? So that's, that's what some people say, Oh, Christ came and He brought the grace, you don't need law. And that's not correct. Absolutely not. If you have the grace, you absolutely would not break the law. Because in grace, you are in law. And in law, you will receive the grace. So there are no separation between the two. And if you want to receive the grace, you have to follow the God's Ten Commandments and Fifteen Commandments and His laws. I hope that makes sense. Go ahead, Lou. Yes, um, some of the prayer. This is uh, the uh, reading from towards page 558 of 30 in the subconscious mind. It says that um, in the third paragraph, the goal is to eradicate that thought. How does one eradicate the thought? Yeah, well, uh, through meditation, through uh, real realization. Okay, many times I have talked about the um, dark creatures in our being, and these dark creatures have the control over our life. They tell us what to do, just like a um, explanation of the uh, Krishna's chariot with wild horses, with five wild horses connected to it. These wild horses pulling this chariot in different direction and the driver in the chariot has no control while God sitting behind the driver and just looking and, and smiling why he cannot control the horses. Okay? And that's exactly how most people's life is. And they are controlled with these uh, senses, which externally pull them to our external world, you know, touch, taste, sight, you know, all these senses, you know, just like the wild horses, 
they are fooling us to our external world and the, the, the part that tell us how to use these senses is our subconscious mind which is the place of the karma from this lifetime and previous lifetime restored in the subconscious mind and therefore the subconscious mind tell us how to react and work in the external world and uh, how we can uh, eradicate this subconscious mind is by knowing yourself but gaining control over your senses by uh, following the commandments of God <laughs> you know but and not not accepting whatever you know the senses tells you to do and uh, the fastest way of course is the eternal divine path you meditate in the communes of light you direct your energy toward the creation of the communes of light therefore you live with a couple of other people it's very easy if you live in an apartment if you live in your house with your wife and your husband and children then living in a place with the in six five other couples or more people around you after a while those people see you right through you they know you inside out they will let you know what your problems are and therefore you progress much faster in the communities of light you know one thing in the communities of light is each person should help other other people to progress, progress physically mentally and spiritually okay? therefore your acceleration your your progress will accelerate hundred times when you are in the community. You know, I, I, I used to tell a story about a yogi who was in the top of the mountain and meditating by itself, by himself at the top of the mountain and he thought he's a great yogi that he has realized all these things. He's so calm, he's so collected, he's so wonderful and everybody comes, he smiles at them and helps them and all that. One day he had to go to the town, had no choice. He comes to town the first person who push him, he become very angry. And suddenly push the other person back and said, what are you doing? I'm a great yogi. And suddenly he realized, wow, what happened to me? What happened to that calm mind and all that? He lost it. The reason was it, it's easy to be in the top of the mountain and you think you're great. But come and live in a community, then you suddenly say, what are these junks coming out of me that I had no idea about that? So you can see, comes of blood is not just living together. It is a very accelerating process of seeing yourself. The more you see of yourself, the less subconscious mind has power over you. Because you become aware of those forces that tells you to do things that you really don't want to do and you feel bad about them after you do them. Okay. The more you know yourself, the more you get control over your subconscious mind and become closer to God, which is the unconscious mind. Therefore, you become self and unconscious mind. There is no subconscious between. That subconscious mind is the real problem, is real ego, is real thing that creates humanity to go astray and create a habit. Another way to, to dissolve it, look at your habit, look at your life. You see, there is going to be a pattern. It's going to happen over and over and over. You know, this, this, I'm sure you have heard somebody say, that if I leave this area and go somewhere else, I'm going to just be okay. I just hate this area. This is the problem. They take, you go to area, a couple of months later, they hate that area too. What happened? You said if you leave from the first area, you're going to be okay. No, the problem is you took the baggage with you when you left one area to another area, and that was your subconscious mind, you know. It wasn't the area, it wasn't the, that the place you leave, it is you, you're taking it with you. <laughs> and nothing to do with other people around you or, or where you are. It, it is inside you, you are the problem. Environment is not the problem. Don't blame anybody else, blame yourself. If it, it is a problem, you are the problem. So, that is subconscious mind, and a lot of humans look for getting rid of the subconsciousness every, everywhere else but within themselves. They blame everybody else, they, they see everybody is against them, they, some people even become paranoid and they think, you know, that everybody, you know, is, is plotting against them and they believe that really they do, but really nobody is really plotting against them, they are plotting against themselves. 
Therefore, meditation, awareness, realization, uh, reading satsang, living in the comments of light, uh, be, you know, desire to you know, know the, yourself, and also breaking the habits. You know, you, you, you can see, you, you are, some people get themselves in a bad relationship all the time. They say, okay, if I'm going to get out of this bad relationship, next one is going to be okay. The next one is going to be the same thing over again, and deja vu. Okay, that, that, that whole love actually is a deja vu. It, it happens over and over, and if you become more aware of these patterns in your life, more and more you realize, yeah, look at that. I'm doing the same thing over and over. Actually, uh, there is a book, I think it's called Self-Analysis. Uh, it is a psychological book. It talks about, you know, uh, about the dreams. If you dream something, wake up and write it down and then analyze it. You can break it down because dreams are three kinds. There are the dreams. Of course, some dreams are nonsense. If you eat too much and you eat, you sleep, you might, you might since the nonsense dream has no meaning. There are dreams which is from the subconscious mind. Okay. Those the dreams are trying to give you a message. They are trying to tell you that is how you solve the problem. Okay. So psychology is also a part of the mission <laughs> and they do not throw it away. And, uh, and if you analyze your dreams, you little by little, if you understand what the message is, you might see this pattern in your life and eventually overcome them. Or write about, you know, some people probably are shy. Why am I shy? Yeah, I was shy yesterday when I was talking to these people. Oh yeah, two days ago, three, a month ago, six months, a year, two years, t ten years, and suddenly you realize there's a pattern you love. You have been shy all your life. Why? You go deeper and deeper, you realize that it could be from this life, it could be from the previous life, uh, you have been put down in, 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 you know, in from the childhood, so you became shy and, and you don't have confidence, whatever. So, uh, you can, there's many ways to understand your subconscious mind, uh, and probably the best way is to use all these techniques together and also shade, put, put light on these uh, subconscious mind, these creatures that um, control your life. Okay. These creatures, this subconscious mind, has been in control of your life all along to this point. Now suddenly you close your eyes and you start meditating and you try to understand your subconscious mind and overcome it. Do you think they're going to let go easily? No. They say, no, we have been in control. Why do you want the control? What was wrong with you? We are the creatures that control your life. And that is when you say, no, I am the boss. I'm not going to let you control my life. Know thyself. Shed light on the habit, bad habits. And little by little, you will succeed. It might take time, but you will succeed. And the fastest is eternal divine path. Believe me, the answer to all human problem is eternal divine path. God was sending this to humanity, a step by step in our religion. Now, we have discussed it here in the mission. Anything we look at, any problem in the society, in personal, it can be resolved with eternal divine path and the realization of this wonderful thing that God has sent to humanity. And of course, we believe also psychology will help. But the greatest is deeper level by meditation and realizing that some of the problem it doesn't have, it is not coming only from your childhood in this lifetime, but from the karma from previous lifetime. Go ahead, Kak. You talk about the eternal divine path. What is it exactly? The eternal divine path is based on the uh, greatest sign. It is the five step awakening of the spiritual forces directing the energy to create the comments of life, sacrificing, surrendering and submission, and becoming universalist, the first awakening of spiritual forces, it are all, uh, all uh, a mystical path, which includes all uh, path that they teach, know thyself to know God, we still that know I am God, which include Hinduism, Buddhism, Kabbalah, um, saints in uh, Christianity, Sufis, and many any other path that tells you to meditate and know thyself. Actually, just my, just my explanation about the creature is a way to know thyself. Okay? That is the 
uh, first step in the eternal divine path. Next is the creation of the Commerce of Life, which is the Old Testament. The whole Old Testament is based on the uh, um, creation of the community, or the com tribe of Israel, which accept God as their God and follow His laws. Uh, to create such a community, sacrifice is necessary. That was the message of Christ, sacrifice, not being self-centered, not to saying what's in, in for me all the time, and then so in the submission to God, which is the uh, uh, ability to uh, surrender the result to God, so you are not attached to the result, or submission, which means God is doing it through you, so you are free from the result anyway, and which is Islam, and the next step is the uh, universalism, shattering all the narrowness of the mind, and directing all your energy and uh, teaching and effort toward the whole universe, and therefore you are not narrow with any ism or separating any part of the universe from anything else and that is Bab and Baha'u'llah's teaching going to the, this five step which is the eternal divine path remember eternal divine path is five step I just explained to you and um, you can go to our website it's all explained there you will learn a lot there do that and you will be blessed with teaching, and uh, you will know what the eternal divine path is. If you follow the eternal divine path, then you become an elect. That is what God is trying to say in His uh, scriptures, that my elect will inherit the earth, and He talks about His elect all the time. So if you want to be an elect, follow the eternal divine path. Realize all these religions have come from the same God. The accepted path is eternal divine path. And the revelation is the revelation of all religions and unification. We have someone here to have a question. Go ahead. Um, Machiji, I just had a question about um, stubbornness. And one thing I've noticed in everyone that gets involved with the mission is we are so stubborn. All of us are really stubborn. And, and even in the Old Testament, it talks about um, my people are stiff-necked. And um, But how, how can we turn that, that stubborn tendency to to be more positive for the mission you know is there is there something good in being stubborn <laughs> I, I guess being being a stubborn is a part of the uh, spirit of pioneers uh, if if you are a pioneer you have to be a stubborn just imagine the people who first came to this country if they were in a stubborn and perseverance and uh, and then would not give up easily <laughs> if they had give up with the first you know, Indian uh, attacked them, or with the first problem in the jungle, or with the with the creation and cutting trees and building houses and roads and all that, they would not have, you know, come and created, you know, you know here. And uh, so, being pioneer, probably if if you are a coward, if if you are a, a you know, not a stubborn, and also as you mentioned, God said, my people are peculiar people and we indeed are peculiar because <laughs> we are not you know nerve we do not we didn't accept you know our parents religion and say oh okay um, you know if we had accept our parents religion I would be a Muslim you would be a Christian you know she would be a you know Jew actually the elect is a peculiar person they are not in the norm of the regular you know uh, or nine to eight <laughs> uh, mold, you know, they have a great feeling that they have a mission. They have come here for a reason. It is just not a regular life to come here, eat, sleep, make children, and die. You will not be satisfied with that. Not not that there's something is wrong with that. You know, ninety nine percent of human probably that's what they do. They come, they eat, they make children, and then die and they are very happy and satisfied and they are doing a good job, that's what they created for, that's fine. But if you are come here for a reason, for a mission, you know you are not going to be satisfied with the regular life, you will be attracted to search, to look, to understand, and eventually hit to the mission of my trail and say, ah, that makes sense. <laughs> you know, ah, that's what I would mean. Actually, you already know our teaching when you come to the mission. That's what I say. The master comes when you already know. 
you know, you, you have been, for many lifetimes, you have been a Jew, you have been a Christian, you have been a Hindu, you have been a Buddhist, you have been... So, you can't just mold yourself in one religion. They come and tell you, you know, God is called Allah, and He's up there, and He's angry all the time. You ask yourself, why? <laughs> why He's up there? Why it's not down here, you know? Why, why, why? why? You, you just keep asking questions. You are not satisfied, and eventually you say, well, probably there is not such a thing as God, because even those people who say, you know, they're Muslim or Allah, they're not really following their teaching, and they're not as good as, you know, they preach their, you know, their religion says they should be. Or most of them don't know what their religion is. Then probably you just reject God and say, you know, probably he doesn't exist, and you become an atheist or, uh, or something like that. Of course, if God wants you, He gets you as He got me. So, and or probably got all of us. So we can see that, yes, God's people are peculiar, they're stubborn, they will not give up easily. They, we, we have seen every religion comes, the followers, especially the first one, are very stubborn, very one-pointed, and very strong. So, you are absolutely right. Uh, how we can make that in the, for the mission? Probably bring a little grace to it, and meditate on the grace of God, and, and uh, be a stubborn, but gracefully be a stubborn. <laughs> so, be, be a gracefully stubborn person. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but <laughs> probably, you know, we can bring more grace into our preaching, and uh, let the humanity knows, know that we are wonderful people, we love them, and our example maybe become, you know, great inspiration for them and they realize, you know, maybe my religion is not as good as I thought it was. Maybe these guys have something that we don't and they desire to be enjoying God's work. Go ahead, Luke. The ethnic background of uh, Abraham, the Hebrews, and uh, Esau's disciples. And Esau's disciples? Uh, the ethnic background of Abraham, Abraham the Hebrews, and the Esau, and his disciples. <clears throat> yeah, actually, Abraham uh, uh, was a Persian. He he lived in in uh, South uh, Iraq, and that was under the influence of Persian Empire. And uh, the Persians themselves are the group that uh, they came from the Europe and there are the um, race of Aryan that is well known. Of course, Hitler used that as a, as a excuse for his, you know, way, but uh, the truth is they came from the Europe and they uh, became two branches. One of them went to North uh, India and one went to North, uh, came from North West of uh, Iran and inter Persia and eventually traveled all the way to the south and, and Iraq. And of course, they mixed with the um, native, which um, were, they, 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 they were darker skinned people. Okay? So it, that is why Middle Eastern have a uh, complexion, you know, darker than white, but not as dark as blacks. And, uh, and in India also, if you look at the North India, the Indians are whiter and the Southern Indians are darker. And we know the continent of India was separated from Africa and went underneath the uh, continent of Asia and pushed it up and all those mountains of uh, Himalayas and all that was created because of that. So the people who came with that piece of uh, land were blacks. and. Uh, and when the Aryans came at the north of India, they mixed with the blacks, with one of the, their uh, leader was uh, Shiva, that married an uh, in, uh, uh, Aryan uh, woman, which was white, and created a new uh, race and religion there. Um, of course, when uh, the branch of the Aryans who came from Europe and went to Iran, later on uh, uh, found a new religion by the name Zoroastrian, which his finder was uh, Zoroaster. And then uh, when they found that religion, actually Zoroastrian seems to be the first 
prophet that he brought the concept of one God and evil, good and evil, to humanity. And he also uh, pre predicted that good and evil will gonna fight to the end. And at the end, of course, good will prevail and evil will be destroyed. And later on, there was a concept of coming of the uh, Messiah. Uh, uh, one, one branch of the Zoroastrian became Mitra. The Mitra uh, had the idea of the Mitra is the uh, one will come and he will be born from the Virgin and he is the savior of the world. And uh, so you can see a similarity between that idea and the Christianity there, right there, that Christ was born from the Virgin and he is the savior of the world and all that. Of course, uh, Abraham later on in, 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 in South Iraq uh, founded the, um, Judaism or, or Hebrew religion and he was Persian, uh, and then he and, and if you see similarity between his teaching and Zoroastrian is amazingly, you know, close. And uh, uh, and later on, when uh, Assyrian carried the Jews from the land and brought, brought to Iraq, then Persian Empire conquered Iraq later on. And Assyrians, the uh, Persian Empire already knew that those people are from Persian. That is why Cyrus brought them to Iran and helped them a lot and made them actually very prominent citizen in Iran and eventually actually helped them to build the temple in, in uh, Jerusalem. So that is completely shows that Cyrus knew that Jewish people are Persian. Of course, uh, Abraham also had the Ishmael and uh, therefore both Jews and Hebrews and Arabs have Persian <laughs> blood in them. And of course, Christ was uh, from the Jewish background, therefore we can see even Christ had some Persian blood in him. And later on, of course, from the coming of the uh, Hebrews to Iran, my ancestor you know, evolved from the Dave, King David to the Nader Shah, and, and I am from the tribe of Judah, okay, so, so we can, that is another prophecy that fulfilled that uh, uh, this teacher or this revelation, this actually, this revelation is accumulation of all the, the previous uh, prophecies and fulfills every prophecy that every religion was expected for their, uh, you know, teacher to fulfill. And therefore, uh, this is fulfilled also. My ancestry is from the King David and Adam, and also uh, my ancestry goes to Prophet Muhammad, and therefore that's also for, this, for, for Muslim that waiting for for this to come to, to from the Prophet Muhammad. So, so Abraham actually, as I said, was uh, had the Persian blood, was Persian, uh, and also Christ was from the same ancestry. Like I said, I explained that before a couple of days weeks ago because I didn't know that with my ancestry. <laughs> Go ahead, talk. Okay. Um, well, there is a blood test that you can take because there's 12 DNA markers that will prove um, without doubt your um, ancestry and you do not have to answer. There's a website that I can post to you at the end. Somebody can send me they can have a blood test made in about $750. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. You can identify your DNA exactly. Um, but that wasn't a question. Uh, I wanted to ask, what was the evidence that you are going to uh, make with, uh, you know, the world? I guess it was my understanding that you talked about a covenant or, or that you make with your disciples. What is this covenant? About the blood test and the... And, and, uh, finding that your uh, ancestor is Jewish. I'm not sure if that the study has been done is correct and the people who did it really were unbiased in the way they did it. So they don't have too much faith on that. I've heard about it. I've like, talked to the people who have done it and, uh, and I asked them a couple of questions they couldn't answer. <laughs> and the people who have done it are uh, people that they really wanted 
to believe what they they came. If there, there is a studies, you have to be very careful about these studies. They come up with the conclusions that they already made their mind that is the, it is, should be and that is, it will be. About the, uh, my covenant with my disciple, uh, I had no choice when I received the mission. I had to start the mission, I had to do it. I had to drop um, everything, my life, my education, my background, my nationality, my religion, everything. Okay? And actually, if you read I became my career, the lecture that uh, one of the people here gave about how I became my prayer. Uh, I had only 10 cents in my pocket and uh, I, I even didn't have the visa to sustain this country and on and on. You can, can read that, how it happened, but uh, still I didn't have any choice. So those who come to the mission see the revelation is uh, correct, is the prophecies are fulfilled and eventually realize it is from God and they know they have a mission they will realize they have no choice also but to be in this mission and do the will of God and they will let me know that yes, it is their mission also and they have no choice and they will make a covenant with me in that and with that exchange it becomes the covenant between me and them and they become a part of the mission and they become my brother and co-worker and we start working together toward the establishment of the kingdom. So um, that is how it works. So if anybody goes to study, realize this is from God, and they know they have a um, mission, and they usually most of the people come here from the childhood. They knew, you know, they have a mission to do. They they, they, they have talked to God that yes, I want to do your mission, and I love you, and all that. And they have no choice. They are not narrow. They do not like to any specific religion or dogma but they want the truth and they found it and they say yes, that's it. Go ahead, I see. He's the one posting the truth and the Christ. Oh, okay. I don't have a mic, but here's my question. Yeah. It's in text. I don't have a mic. Okay, what is, okay, what is your question? No, my Maitreya does not sin. He is sinless. He's been sinless. He will be sinless forever and therefore You cannot tell my three your sins at all. Uh -huh. He does not sin. Especially when God comes through. <laughs> and and even even when God, God doesn't come through, my three does not sin. Go ahead, Lou. Yes, we have a uh, clarification on, on the uh, Shiva thing. You say Shiva married uh, an alien, or was she a... Uh, uh, black and female? Or, or no, Shiva, Shiva was a, a native of uh, India. And so he had the dark skin, he was black. And uh, he, he, used to be medi med med he used to meditate. And uh, most of the people who meditated, they went to the rooms and they were very comfortable or there were places. And he would go to the graveyard and actually put the skull around himself or have a, you know, necklace of a skull, and so he, he, he was became very mysterious. And he is the founder of the Tantra meditation and Tantra yoga in India. And uh, Tantra yoga is still is shrouded with mystery as, and, and a lot of, you know, uh, mystical realization. And even in the West, uh, it reached to a point, they think, mm, Tantra means a sexual relationship and, and that's the only thing they have seen in Tantra and that is not uh, what the meaning of the Tantra is. Tantra is the ability to stay in the middle of the controversy and uh, destruction and not being affected with it at all. So uh, we can see that is, that is absolutely different than what in West they teach about Tantra meditation. And he, he was the founder of that path, and he, he, he was a prince, actually, and he marries an Aryan woman. Actually, it was very rare marriage between native Indian and an Aryan who came from Europe, because their culture was so different. And, um, and then it seems like it's the first marriage between 
in the two cultures that occur through Shiva, and that creates a new trend in India, and eventually the two races mix and make northern in India, which is whiter, and southern India, which is darker skin. Go ahead, Ya Sahib Zaman. Bahala said there won't be any more prophets after him after one thousand years. How do you explain that? Okay, good, all right. Maybe John, do you want to answer him about the Baha'i teaching? Yes, yes, John, we can hear you fine. Go ahead. Um, if we look uh, in the Katabi of Das and the Katabi of uh, I believe is what you're referring to, and uh, Bellini, it says that verse that uh, a thousand years. Um, but if we look also in the writings of Abdul Baha himself, he explains that in one part of the thousand years, and he says that it doesn't have anything to do with the universal manifestation. Uh, he says it doesn't have anything to do with the universal manifestation. That's on page 56 of uh, some answer, no, not some answer question. Um, I can't remember the other title. Oh, uh, selections from the writings of Abdul Baha. So if someone asks a question about the thousand years, and he says it, it has nothing to do with the universal manifestation has nothing to do with it. And then if we look on page 56, and some answer the question, when he's speaking about the seventh angel, he says the seventh angel will come, he will bring the kingdom of heaven on earth, and he will be a divine and universal manifestation. So even at, at this level, the thousand years uh, doesn't pertain uh, to a universal manifestation. And if we know all the high scriptures, we know the seventh angel is going to come and be that and if we understand the mission and its teachings, we'll say, oh, this is the seventh angel. This is the one who uh, reveals uh, all there is. It brings so, the holiest of the holies, which is also on page 56 of some ancient question. The seventh angel will bring the holiest of the holies. So we can say, ah, oh, okay, so this doesn't have to deal with the universal manifestation and his coming, but instead we can look at the mission's understanding of it and we can see it, it deals with the period form the trigger. Uh, so this is a very much coherent, coherent with the teachings of, of the Baha'i faith there as well. And no way is there, is there a contradiction. John brought this prophet even before he knew about the mission at all. So that is why he answered the question. And my answer to you is the same. It was not for Baha'u'llah. It was for this mission. And if you can see that, then you will see that the next thousand years, even more than that, there will not be any other great manifestation, but this is the last manifestation for a long, long time. Go ahead, I have a dream. Okay, Salam, everyone. Um, as I'm sitting here listening, um, I'm humbling my heart as best that I can. There are a few things that bother me, and please, with all due respect, I respect you. And um, although there is one thing that, that um, is getting me right in the pit of my stomach, oh. and that is the fact that you say you're sinless. I heard that as I was making coffee, and no one here is sinless. Um, no one is perfect from my understanding, and you are yet claiming that. Um, you are still subject to ego while you're on this earth and in a physical vehicle, and I am witness to that. I have seen a lot of comings and goings of people who call themselves a Messiah, and um, I am fearful that you are falling into the pit of ego, and I want to hear your response to this. Um, understand that um, I'm, I'm aware of many things as well as you may be aware of many things and I, this is not the first that I've heard of an eternal divine path. You have many truths, um, although I do see a pitfall here. 
I hope you don't feel that you are sinless either and you don't have any ego. <laughs> and uh, if you believe that you have an uh, ego, then how can you judge me? You know, you haven't overcome and you are not few and you haven't taken the bean out of your eyes. How can you come and judge me that I am wrong? Is God sin sinful? Can He sin? When I am here and sitting here and giving sad song, he is talking and he is sinless. And he cannot sin. So, so let's see first, if, if you are unhappy, know that I say I am sinless, because you see the body, a human sitting here, and you accuse him, but you don't realize that it is the spirit behind the body who is talking. And also the person who asked that question, he, I knew what his, his next question would be, that Christ is sinless and he is the only way, I am a false prophet, therefore, you know, I am blocking his next question that would be a waste of time. Okay. Okay? So the answer to that question had many, many aspects and you saw only one a human saying he is sinless. So, realize that what is happening here and also accept, if you accept who I am, then you will realize the answer was perfect as it was. I can give you a credential of my claim here, why I claim what I claim, and my credential is a very long one, <laughs> okay? I was being guided to this vision, okay, and the whole my life is being based to come to this vision. I received this vision in Baha'i Temple. I received the revelation after that. And uh, teaching alone was enough for me to say, yes, that makes sense. I was not looking for any prophecy to confirm my claim and what I say is to be true. Of course, later on, the, the prophecies start trickling in, little by little, and then one disciple said, well, he likes to put them together. And she even studied many things, and she found many, many prophecies, and I said, well, that's enough. We have every prophecies, and then two years later, suddenly, John, the gentleman who just talked, came around and said, bring more prophecies fulfilled. And a month or two months ago, you know, a gentleman, our beloved uh, brother Frank comes and asks me if I am connected to David, King David or not. I say, well, that doesn't matter. That is fulfilled with the, with the Christ. And I really meant it. And then he goes and he finds, yes, you know, my, my gene genealogy goes to da David and he, without he knowing it, he also realized that my genealogy is also going to Prophet Muhammad. So this individual sitting here and talking to you is very, very unique. It is impossible to create an individual like this, okay, and say, oh, it is just by chance. It is not by chance. It is the fulfillment of the prophecy. It's the uniqueness of God's choosing this vessel to come here and preach to humanity the revelation of God. You have to look at this thing and say, oh, is that, is that any, any truth in them? Therefore you can see, I have all the right to claim what I claim. You know, and, and therefore, it is the fulfillment of God's prophecy. This is the last revelation. Now a person, a Christian, come here and say, am I sinless? Yes, when I sit here and I talk that God, God is sinless and has not sinned and me and the Father are one and nobody goes to bother but through me. And the, would they understand that? Probably not. I know the next question they have, therefore it's just waste of time to go to the detail that it's nothing to do with the, this teaching and all that. There are a lot of uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, you know, 
coming along here and also a lot of negative things is rising from the same Saudis and, uh, and Pharisees that were there 2,000 years ago. Therefore, you know, you cannot just come and judge me because there's much, much more into it than meets the eye. All right? So, uh, in truth, the spirit behind me, God is sinless and he is the Savior. He has never seen, he's pure, and he is the way. Okay? So, be a little patient, be a little deeper, meditate, and see the spirit behind the question and the spirit behind the man. If you see that, then it's much easier for you. Okay, I guess our time is up, and uh, thanks for coming. I hope you received some blessing of this satsang. Yeah. And I'll be here next week. You we'll come, go to our website again, read our teaching, understand what we're talking about, and then come with the question about the teaching and what this revelation is all about and how it has unified humanity and is here to bring the peace on earth and kingdom of heaven to humanity. Salam.